Section 6 of Chapter 16 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 16, Section 6. When it was known that the French troops had quitted Limerick, and that the Irish only remained, the general expectation in the English camp was that the city would be an easy conquest. Nor was that expectation unreasonable, for even Sarsfield desponded. One chance, in his opinion, there still was. William had brought with him none but small guns, several large pieces of ordnance, a great quantity of provisions and ammunition, and a bridge of tin boats, which in the watery plain of the Shannon was frequently needed, were slowly falling from Cashel. If the guns and gunpowder could be intercepted and destroyed, there might be hope. If not, all was lost, and the best thing that a brave and high-spirited Irish gentleman could do was to forget the country which he had in vain tried to defend, and to seek in some foreign land a home or a grave. A few hours, therefore, after the English tents had been pitched before Limerick, Sarsfield set forth, under cover of night, with a strong body of horse and dragoons. He took the road to Killaloo and crossed the Shannon there. During the day he lurked with his bands in a wild mountain tract named from the silver mines which it contains. Those mines had many years before been worked by English proprietors with the help of engineers and laborers imported from the continent. But in the rebellion of 1641, the aboriginal population had destroyed the works and massacred the workmen, nor had the devastation then committed been since repaired. In this desolate region, Sarsfield found no lack of scouts or guides, for all the peasantry of Munster was zealous on his side. He learned in the evening that the detachment which guarded the English artillery had halted for the night about seven miles from William's camp, on a pleasant carpet of green turf under the ruined walls of an old castle that officers and men seemed to think themselves perfectly secure, and that the beasts had been turned loose to graze, and that even the sentinels were dozing. When it was dark, the Irish horsemen quitted their hiding place and were conducted by the people of, of the country um, to the place where the escorts lay sleeping round the guns. The surprise was complete. Some of the English sprang to their arms and made an attempt to resist, but in vain. About sixty fell. Only one was taken alive. The rest fled. The victorious Irish made a huge pile of wagons and pieces of cannon. Every gun was stuffed with powder and fixed with its mouth in the ground, and the whole mass was blown up. The solitary prisoner, a lieutenant, was treated with great civility by Sarsfield. If I had failed in this attempt, said the gallant Irishman, I should have been off to France. Intelligence had been carried to William's headquarters that Sarsfield had stolen out of Limerick and was ranging the country. The king guessed the design of his brave enemy and sent five hundred horse to protect the guns. Unhappily, there was some delay, which the English, always disposed to believe the worst of the Dutch courtiers, attributed to the negligence and perverseness of Portland. At one in the morning the detach detachment set out, but had scarcely left the camp when a blaze like lightning and a crash like thunder announced to the wide plain of the Shannon that all was over. Sarsfield had long been the favorite of his countrymen, and this most seasonable exploit judiciously planned and vigorously executed, raised him still higher in their estimation. Their spirits rose, and the besiegers began to lose heart. William did his best to repair his loss. Two of the guns which had been blown up were found to still be serviceable. Two more were sent for from Waterford. Batteries were constructed of small field pieces, which, though they might have been useless against one of the fortresses of Hainaut or Brabant, made some impression on the feeble defences of Limerick. Several of the outworks were carried by storm, and a breach in the rampart of the city began to appear. During these operations the English army was astonished and amused by an incident which produced, indeed, no very important consequences, but illustrated in the most striking manner the real nature of Irish Jacobitism. In the first rank of those great Celtic houses, which down to, to the close of the reign of Elizabeth bore rule in Ulster, were the O'Donnells. The head of that house had yielded to the skill and energy of Mountjoy, 
had kissed the hands of James I, and had consented to exchange the rude independence of a petty prince for an eminently honorable place among British subjects. During a short time the vanquished chief held the rank of an earl, and was the landlord of an immense domain of which he had once been sovereign. But soon he began to suspect the government of plotting against him, and, in revenge or in self-defense, plotted against the government. His schemes failed. He fled to the continent. His title and his states were forfeited, and an Anglo-Saxon colony was planted in the territory which he had governed. He meanwhile took refuge at the court of Spain. Between that court and the aboriginal Irish, there had, during the long contest between Philip and Elizabeth, been a close connection. The exiled chieftain was welcomed at Madrid as a good Catholic flying from heretical persecutors. His illustrious descent and princely dignity, which to the English were subjects of ridicule, secured him the respect of the Castilian grandees. His honors were inherited by a succession of banished men who lived and died far from the land where the memory of their family was fondly cherished by a rude peasantry and was kept fresh by the songs and minstrels and the tales of begging friars. At length, in the eighty-third year of the exile of this ancient dynasty, it was known all over Europe that the Irish were again in arms for their independence. Balderic O'Donnell, who called himself the O'Donnell, a title far prouder in the estimation of his race than any marquisate or dukedom, had been bred in Spain and was in the service of the Spanish government. He requested the permission of that government to repair to Ireland. But the House of Austria was now closely leagued with England, and the permission was refused. The O'Donnell made his escape by a circuitous route in the course of which he visited Turkey, arrived at Kinsale a few days after James had sailed thence for France. The effect produced on the native population by the arrival of this solitary wanderer was marvelous. Since Ulster had been reconquered by the Englishry, great multitudes of the Irish inhabitants of that province had migrated southward and were leading a vagrant life in Cano and Munster. These men, accustomed from their infancy to hear of the good old times, when the O'Donnell solemnly inaugurated on the rocks of Kilmacnenan uh, by the successor of St. Cullum, governed the mountains of Donegal in defiance of the strangers of the Pale, flocked to the standard of the restored exile. He was soon at the head of seven or eight thousand repari, or to use the name peculiar to Ulster, crates and his followers adhered to him with a loyalty very different from the languid sentiment which the Saxon James had been able to inspire. Priests and even bishops swelled the train of the adventurers. He was so much elated by this reception that he sent agents to France who assured the ministers of Lewis that O'Donnell would, if furnished with arms and ammunition, bring into the field 30,000 Celts from Ulster, and that the Celts of Ulster would be found far superior in every military quality to those of Leinster, Munster, and Canoe. No expression used by Balderic indicated that he considered himself as a subject. His notion, evidently, was that the House of O'Donnell was as truly and as indefeasibly royal as the House of Stuart. Not a few of his countrymen were in the same mind. He made a pompous entrance into Limerick, and his appearance there raised the hope of the garrison to a strange pitch. Numerous prophecies were recollected or invented, and O'Donnell with a red mark was to be the deliverer of his country, and Balderic met a red mark, and O'Donnell was to gain a great battle over the English near Limerick, and at Limerick the O'Donnell and the English were now brought face to face. While these predictions were eagerly repeated by the defenders of the city, evil presages uh, grounded not on barbarous oracles but on grave military reasons, began to disturb William and his most experienced officers. The blow struck by Sarsfield had told. The artillery had been long in doing its work. That work was now even very imperfectly done. The stock of powder had begun to run low. Autumnal rain had begun to fall. The soldiers in the trenches were up to their knees in mire. No precaution was neglected, but though drains were dug to carry off the water, 
and though pewter basins of usquiba and brandy blazed all night in the tents cases of fever had already occurred and it might well be apprehended that if the army remained but a few days longer on that swampy soil there would be a pestilence more terrible than that which had raged twelve months before under the walls of dundalk a council of war was held and it was determined to make one great effort and if that effort failed to raise the siege on the twenty seventh of august at three in the afternoon the signal was given five hundred grenadiers rushed from their english trenches to the counterscarp fired their pieces and threw their grenades the irish fled into the town and were followed by the assailants who in the excitement of victory did not wait for orders then began a terrible street fight the irish as soon as they had recovered from their surprise stood resolutely to their arms and the english grenadiers overwhelmed by numbers were with great loss driven back to the counterscarp there the struggle was long and desperate when indeed was the roman catholic celt to fight if he did not fight on that day the very women of limerick mingled in the combat stood firmly under the hottest fire and flung stones and broken bottles at the enemy in the moment when the conflict was fiercest, a mine exploded and hurled a fine german battalion into the air during four hours the carnage and the uproar continued the thick cloud which rose from the breach streamed out on the wind for many miles and disappeared behind the hills of clare late in the evening the besiegers retired slowly and sullenly to their camp their hope was that a second attack would be made on the morrow and the soldiers vowed to have the town or die but the powder was now almost exhausted the rain fell in torrents the gloomy mass of clouds which came up from the southwest threatened a havoc more terrible than that of the sword there was a reason to fear that the roads which were already deep in mud would soon be in such a state that no wheeled carriage could be dragged through them the king determined to raise the siege and to move his troops to a healthier region he had in truth stayed long enough for it was with great difficulty that his guns and wagons were tugged away by the long teams of oxen the history of the first siege of Limerick bears, in some respects, a remarkable analogy to the history of the siege of Londonderry. The southern city was, like the northern city, the last asylum of a church and of a nation. Both places were crowded by fugitives from all parts of Ireland. Both places appeared to men who had made a regular study of the art of war, incapable of resisting an enemy. Both were in the moment of extreme danger abandoned by those commanders who should have defended them lauzon and tyrconnel deserted limerick as cunningham and lundy had deserted londonderry in both cases religious and patriotic enthusiasm struggled unassisted against great odds and in both cases religious and patriotic enthusiasm did what veteran warriors had pronounced it absurd to attempt it was with no pleasurable emotions that Lausanne and Tyrconnel learned at Galway the fortunate issue of the conflict in which they had refused to take part. They were weary of Ireland. They were apprehensive that their conduct might be unfavorably represented in France, and they therefore determined to be beforehand with their accusers and took ship together for the continent. Tyrconnel, before he departed, delegated his civil authority to one council and his military authority to another. The young Duke of Berwick was declared commander-in-chief, but this dignity was merely nominal. Sarsfield, undoubtedly the first of Irish soldiers, was placed last in the list of councillors to whom the conduct of the war was entrusted, and some believe that he would not have been in the list at all had not the Viceroy feared that the omission of so popular a name might produce a mutiny. William, meanwhile, had reached Waterford, and had sailed thence for England. Before he embarked, he entrusted the government of Ireland to three Lord Justices. Henry Sidney, now Viscount Sidney, stood first in the commission, and with him were joined Coningsby and Sir Charles Porter. Porter had formerly held the great seal of the kingdom, had, merely because he was a Protestant, been deprived of it by James, and had now received it again from the hand of William. On the 6th of September, the king, after a voyage of twenty-four hours, landed at Bristol. 
Thence he traveled to London, stopping by the road at the mansions of some great lords, and it was remarked that all those who were thus honored were Tories. He was entertained one day at Badminton by the Duke of Beaufort, who was supposed to have brought himself with great difficulty to take the oaths, and on a subsequent day at a large house near Marlborough, which, in our own time, before the great revolution produced by railways, was renowned as one of the best inns in England, but which, in the seventeenth century, was a seat of the Duke of Somerset. William was everywhere received with marks of respect and joy. His campaign, indeed, had not ended quite so prosperously as it had begun. But on the whole, his success had been great beyond his expectations, and had fully vindicated the wisdom of his resolution to command his army in person. The sack of Tainmouth, too, was fresh in the minds of the Englishmen, and had for a time reconciled all but the most fanatical Jacobites to each other and to the throne. The magistracy and clergy of the capital repaired to Kensington with thanks and congratulations. The people rang bells and kindled bonfires. For the Pope, whom good Protestants had been accustomed to immolate, the French king was on this occasion substituted, probably by way of retaliation for the insults which had been offered to the effigy of William by the Parisian populace. A waxen figure, which was doubtless a hideous caricature of the most graceful and majestic of princes, was dragged about Westminster in a chariot. Above was inscribed in large letters, Louis the Greatest Tyrant of Fourteen. After the procession, the image was committed to the flames amidst Laos Hazas in the middle of Covent Garden. When William arrived in London, the expedition destined for Cork was ready to sail from Portsmouth, and Marlborough had been some time on board waiting for a fair wind. He was accompanied by Grafton. This young man had been immediately after the departure of James, and while the throne was still vacant, named by William Colonel of the 1st Regiment of Foot Guards. The revolution had scarcely been consummated when signs of disaffection began to appear in the regiment the most important both because of its peculiar duties and because of its numerical strength of all the regiments in the army it was thought that the colonel had not put this bad spirit down with a sufficiently firm hand he was known not to be perfectly satisfied with the new arrangement he had voted for a regency it was rumored perhaps without reason that he had dealings with saint germain the honorable lucrative command to which he had just been appointed was taken from him Though severely mortified, he behaved like a man of sense and spirit. Bent on proving that he had been wrongfully suspected, and animated by an honorable ambition to distinguish himself in his profession, he obtained permission to serve as a volunteer under Marlborough in Ireland. End of section six. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. of chapter 16 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by richard carpenter history of england by thomas babington macaulay chapter 16 section 7 at length on the 18th of september the wind changed the fleet stood out to sea and on the 21st appeared before the harbor of cork the troops landed and were speedily joined by the Duke of Württemberg, with several regiments of Dutch, Danish, and French detached from the army that had lately besieged Limerick. The Duke immediately put forward a claim which, if the English general had not been a man of excellent judgment and temper, might have been fatal to the expedition. His Highness contended that, as a prince of a sovereign house, he was entitled to command-in-chief. Marlborough calmly and politely showed that the pretense was unreasonable. A dispute followed in which it is said that the German behaved with rudeness, and that the Englishman with the gentle firmness to which, more perhaps than even his great abilities, he owed his success in life. At length a Huguenot officer suggested a compromise. Marlborough consented to waive part of his rights, and to allow precedence to the Duke on alternate days. The first morning on which Marlborough had the command, he gave the word Württemberg, the duke's heart was won by this compliment on the next day he gave the word marlborough but whoever might give the word genius asserted its indefeasible superiority marlborough was on every day the real general 
Cork was vigorously attacked. Outwork after outwork was rapidly carried. In 48 hours, all was over. The traces of the short struggle may still be seen. The old fort, where the Irish made the hardest fight, lies in ruins. The Daria Cathedral, so ungracefully joined to the ancient tower, stands on the site of a Gothic edifice that was shattered by the English cannon. In the neighboring churchyard is still shown the spot where stood, during many ages, one of those round towers which have perplexed antiquaries. The venerable monument shared the fate of the neighboring church. On another spot, which is now called the Mall, and is lined by stately houses of banking companies, railway companies, and insurance companies, but which then was a bog known by the name of Rape Marsh. Four English regiments, up to the shoulders in water, advanced gallantly to the assault. Grafton, ever foremost in danger, while struggling through the quagmire, was struck by a shot from the ramparts, and was carried back dying. The place where he fell, then about a hundred yards without the city, but now situated in the very center of business and population, is still called Grafton Street. The assailants had made their way through the swamp, and the close fighting was just about to begin when a parley was beaten. Articles of capitulation were speedily adjusted. The garrison between four and five thousand fighting men became prisoners. Marlborough promised to intercede with the king both for them and for the inhabitants, and to prevent outrage and spoliation. His troops he succeeded in restraining, but the crowds of sailors and camp followers came into the city through the breach, and the houses of many Roman Catholics were sacked before order was restored. No commander has ever understood better than Marlborough how to improve a victory. A few hours after Cork had fallen, his cavalry were on the road to Kinsale. A trumpeter was sent to summon the place. The Irish threatened to hang him for bringing such a message, set fire to the town, and retired into two forts called the Old and the New. The English horse arrived just in time to extinguish the flames. Marlborough speedily followed with his infantry. The Old Fort was scaled, and 450 men who defended it were all killed or taken. The New Fort it was necessary to attack in a more methodical way. Batteries were planted, trenches were opened, mines were sprung, and in a few days the besiegers were master of the counterscarp, and all was ready for storming, when the governor offered to capitulate. The garrison, twelve hundred strong, was suffered to retire to Limerick, but the conquerors took possession of the stores which were of considerable value. Of all the Irish ports, Kinsale was the best situated for intercourse with France. Here, therefore, was a plenty unknown in any other part of Munster. At Limerick, bread and wine were luxuries which generals and privy councillors were not always able to procure. But in the new fort of Kinsale, Marlborough found a thousand barrels of wheat and eighty pipes of claret. His success had been complete and rapid, and indeed, had it not been rapid, it would not have been complete. His campaign, short as it was, had been long enough to allow for the deadly work which, in that age, the moist earth and air of Ireland seldom failed in the autumnal season to perform on English soldiers. The malady which had thinned the ranks of Schomburg's army at Dundalk, and which had compelled William to make a hasty retreat from the estuary of the Shannon, had begun to appear at Kinsale. Quick and vigorous as Marlborough's operations were, he lost a much greater number of men by disease than by the fire of the enemy. He presented himself at Kensington only five weeks after he had sailed from Portsmouth, and was most graciously received. No officer living, said William, who has seen so little service as my Lord Marlborough, is so fit for great commands. In Scotland, as in Ireland, the aspect of things had, during this memorable summer, changed greatly for the better. That club of discontented Whigs, which had in the preceding year ruled Parliament, browbeaten the ministers, refused the supplies, and stopped the signet, had sunk under general contempt and had at length ceased to exist. There was harmony between sovereign and estates, and the long contest between two forms of ecclesiastical government had been terminated in the only way compatible with the peace and prosperity of the country. This happy turn in affairs is to be chiefly ascribed to the heirs of the perfidious, turbulent, and revengeful Montgomery. Some weeks after the close of that session during which he had exercised a boundless authority over the Scottish Parliament, 
he went to london with his two principal confederates the earl of annandale and the lord ross the three had an audience with william and presented to him a manifesto setting forth what they demanded for their public they would very soon have changed their tone if he would have granted what they demanded for themselves but he resented their conduct deeply and was determined not to pay them for annoying him the reception which he gave them convinced them that they had no favor to expect montgomery's passion was fierce his wants were pressing he was miserably poor and if he could not speedily force himself into a lucrative office he would be in danger of rotting in jail since his services were not likely to be bought by william they must be offered to james a broker was easily found montgomery was an old acquaintance of ferguson the two traders soon understood each other they were kindred spirits differing widely in intellectual power but equally vain restless false and malevolent montgomery was introduced to neville payne one of the most adroit and resolute agents of the exiled family payne had been long well known about town as a dabbler in poetry and politics he had been an intimate friend of the indiscreet and unfortunate coleman and had been committed to newgate as an accomplice in the popish plot his moral character had not stood high but he soon had an opportunity of proving that he possessed courage and fidelity worthy of a better cause than that of james and of a better associate than montgomery the negotiation speedily ended in a treaty of alliance payne confidently promised montgomery not merely pardon but riches power and dignity montgomery as confidently undertook to induce the parliament of scotland to recall the rightful king ross and annadale readily agreed to whatever their able and active colleague proposed an adventurer who was sometimes called simpson and sometimes jones who was perfectly willing to serve or to betray any government for hire and who received wages at once from portland and from neville payne undertook to carry the offers of the club to james montgomery and his two noble accomplices returned to edinburgh and there proceeded to form a coalition with their old enemies the defenders of prelacy and of arbitrary power the scottish opposition strangely made up of two factions one zealous for bishops the other zealous for synods one hostile to all liberty the other impatient of all government flattered itself during a short time with hopes that the civil war would break out in the highlands with redoubled fury but those hopes were disappointed in the spring of sixteen ninety an officer named buchan arrived in lo Aber from ireland he bore a commission which appointed him general-in-chief of all the forces which were in arms for king james throughout the kingdom of scotland cannon who had since the death of dundee held the first post and had proved himself unfit for it became second in command little however was gained by the change it was no easy matter to induce the gaelic princes to renew the war indeed but for the influence and eloquence of lachiel not a sword would have been drawn for the house of stuart he with some difficulty persuaded the chieftains who in the preceding year fought at kilcranky to come to a resolution that before the end of the summer they would muster all of their followers and march into the lowlands in the meantime twelve hundred mountaineers of different tribes were placed under the orders of buchan who undertook with this force to keep the english garrisons in constant alarm by feints and incursions till the season of a more important operation should arrive he accordingly marched into Strasbe, but all his plans were speedily disconcerted by the boldness and dexterity of sir thomas livingston who held inverness for king william livingston guided and assisted by the grants who were firmly attached to the new government came with a strong body of cavalry and dragoons by forced marches and through arduous defiles to the place where the jacobites had taken up their quarters he reached the campfires at the dead of night the first alarm was given by the rush of horses over the terrified sentinels into the midst of the crowd of celts who lay sleeping in their plaids buchan escaped bareheaded and without his sword cannon ran away in his shirt the conquerors lost not a man four hundred highlanders were killed or taken the rest fled to their hills and mists this event put an end to all thoughts of civil war the gathering which had been planned for the summer never took place lachiel even if he had been willing was not able to sustain any longer the falling cause 
he had been laid on his bed by a mishap which would alone suffice to show how little could be affected by a confederacy of the petty kings of the mountains at a consultation of jacobite leaders a gentleman from the lowlands spoke with severity of those sycophants who had changed their religion to curry favor with king james glengarry was one of those people who think it dignified to suppose that everybody is always insulting them he took it in his head that some allusion to himself was meant i am as good a protestant as you he cried and added a word not to be patiently borne by a man of spirit in a moment both swords were out lachiel thrust himself between the combatants and while forcing them asunder received a wound which was at first believed to be mortal so effectually had the spirit of the disaffected claims been cowed that mackay marched unresisted from perth to lochaber fixed his headquarters at Inverlochy, and proceeded to execute his favorite design of erecting at that place a fortress which might overawe the mutinous camerons and macdonalds in a few days the walls were raised the ditches were sunk the palisades were fixed demi culverins from a ship of war were arranged along the perperates and the general departed leaving an officer named hill in command of a sufficient garrison within the defences there was no want of oatmeal red herring and beef and there was rather a superabundance of brandy the new stronghold which hastily and rudely as it had been constructed seemed doubtless to the people of the neighborhood the most stupendous work that power and science united had ever produced and was named fort william in honor of the king by this time the scottish parliament had reassembled at edinburgh william had found it no easy matter to decide what course should be taken with that capricious and unruly body the english commons had sometimes put him out of temper yet they had granted him millions and had never asked from him such concessions as had been imperiously demanded by the scottish legislature which could give him little and had given him nothing the english statesmen with whom he had to deal did not generally stand or serve to stand high in his esteem yet few of them were so utterly false and shameless as the leading scottish politicians hamilton was in morality and honor rather above than below his fellows and even hamilton was fickle false and greedy i wish to heaven william was once provoked into exclaiming that scotland were a thousand miles off and that the duke of hamilton were the king of it then i should be rid of them both after much deliberation william determined to send melville down to edinburgh as lord high commissioner melville was not a great statesman he was not a great orator and he did not look or move like the representative of a royalty his character was not of more than standard purity and the standard purity among scottish senators was not high but he was by no means deficient in prudence or temper and he succeeded on the whole better than a man of much higher qualities might have done during the first days of the session the friends of the government desponded and the chiefs of the opposition were sanguine montgomery's head though by no means a weak one had been turned by the triumphs of the preceding year he believed that his intrigues and his rhetoric had completely subjugated the estates it seemed to him impossible that having exercised a boundless empire in the parliament house when the jacobites were absent he should be defeated when they were present and ready to support whatever he proposed he had not indeed found it easy to prevail on them to attend for they could not take their seats without taking the oaths a few of them had some slight scruple of conscience about forswearing themselves and many who did not know what a scruple of conscience meant were apprehensive that they might offend the rightful king by vowing fealty to the actual king some lords however who were supposed to be in the confidence of james asserted that to their knowledge he wished his friends to perjure themselves and this assertion induced most of the jacobites with balcarus at their head to be guilty of perfidy aggravated by impiety it soon appeared however that montgomery's faction even with this reinforcement was no longer a majority of the legislature for every supporter that he had gained he had lost two he had committed an error which has more than once in british history been fatal to great parliamentary leaders he had imagined that as soon as he chose to coalesce with those to whom he had recently been opposed all of his followers would imitate his example he soon found that it was much easier to inflame animosities than to appease them the great body of whigs and presbyterians 
shrank from the fellowship of the Jacobites. Some waivers were purchased by the government, nor was the purchase expensive, for a sum which would hardly be missed in the English treasury was immense in the estimation of the needy barons of the north. Thus the scale was turned, and, in the Scottish Parliament of that age, the turn of the scale was everything. The tendency of majorities was always to increase, the tendency of minorities to diminish. The first question on which a vote was taken related to the election for a borough. The ministers carried their point by six voices. In an instant everything was changed. The spell was broken. The club from being a bugbear became a laughing stock. The timid and the venal passed over in crowds from the weaker to the stronger side. It was in vain that the opposition attempted to revive the disputes of the preceding year. The king had wisely authorized Melville to give up the Committee of Articles. The estates, on the other hand, showed no disposition to pass another act of incapacitation, to censure the government for opening the court of justice, or to question the right of the sovereign to name the judges. An extraordinary supply was voted, small according to the notions of English financiers, but large for the means of Scotland. The sum granted was a hundred and sixty-two thousand pounds sterling to be raised over the course of four years. The Jacobites, who found that they had forsworn themselves to no purpose, sate, bowed down by shame, and writhing with vexation, while Montgomery, who had deceived himself in them, and who, in his rage, had utterly lost not indeed his parts and his fluency, but all decorum and self-command, scolded like a waterman on the Thames, and was answered with equal asperity, and even more than equal ability, by Sir John Dalrymple. End of section 7. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Section 8 of Chapter 16 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Carpenter. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 16, Section 8. The most important acts of this session were those which fixed the ecclesiastical constitution of Scotland. By the claim of right, it had been declared that the authority of the bishops was an insupportable grievance, and William, by accepting the crown, had bound himself not to uphold an institution condemned by the very instrument on which his title to the crown depended. But the claim of right had not defined the form of the church government which was to be substituted for episcopacy, and during the stormy session held in the summer of 1689, the violence of the club had made legislation impossible. During many months, therefore, everything had been in confusion. One polity had been pulled down, and no other polity had been set up. In the western lowlands, the beneficed clergy had been so effectually rabbled that scarcely one of them had remained at his post. In Berwick, the three Lothians and Stirling, most of the curates, had been removed by the Privy Council for not obeying that vote of the Convention which had directed all ministers of parishes on pain of deprivation to proclaim William and Mary King and Queen of Scotland. Thus, throughout a great part of the realm, there was no public worship except what was performed by Presbyterian divines, who sometimes officiated in tents, and sometimes, without any legal right, took possession of the churches. But there were large districts, especially on the north of the Tay, where the people had no strong feeling against episcopacy. And there were many priests who were not disposed to lose their manses and stipends for the sake of King James. Hundreds of the old curates, therefore, having been neither hunted by the populace or deposed by the council, still performed their spiritual functions. Every minister was, during this time of transition, free to conduct the services and to administer the sacraments as he thought fit. There was no controlling authority. The legislature had taken away the jurisdiction of bishops and had not established the jurisdiction of synods. To put an end to this anarchy was one of the first duties of the Parliament. Melville had, with the powerful assistance of Carstairs, obtained, in spite of remonstrances of the English Tories, authority to assent to such ecclesiastical arrangements as might satisfy the Scottish nation. 
one of the first laws which the lord commissioner touched with the sceptre repealed the act of supremacy he next gave royal assent to a law enacting that those presbyterian divines who had been pastors of parishes in the days of the covenant and had after the restoration been ejected for refusing to acknowledge episcopal authority should be restored the number of those pastors had originally been about three hundred and fifty but not more than sixty were still living the estates then proceeded to fix the national creed the confession of faith drawn up by the assembly of divines at westminster the longer and shorter catechism and the directory were considered by every good presbyterian as the standards of orthodoxy and it was hoped that the legislature would recognize them as such this hope however was in part disappointed the confession was read at length amidst much yawning and adopted without alteration but when it was proposed that the catechisms and the directory should be taken into consideration the ill-humor of the audience broke forth into murmurs for that love of long sermons which was strong in the scottish commonality was not shared by the scottish aristocracy the parliament had already been listening during three hours to dry theology it was not inclined to hear anything more about original sin and election. The Duke of Hamilton said that the estates had already done all that was essential. They had given their sanction to a digest of the great principles of Christianity. The rest might well be left to the church. The weary majority eagerly assented, in spite of the mutterings of some of the zealous Presbyterian ministers who had been admitted to hear the debate and who sometimes could hardly restrain themselves from taking part in it the memorable law which fixed the ecclesiastical constitution of scotland was brought in by the earl of sutherland by this law the synodic polity was re-established the rule of the church was entrusted to the sixty ejected ministers who had just been restored and to such other persons whether ministers or elders as the sixty should think fit to admit to a participation of power the sixty and their nominees were authorized to visit all the parishes in the kingdom and to turn out all ministers who were deficient in abilities scandalous in morals or unsound in faith those parishes which had during the interregnum been deserted by their pastors or in plain words those parishes which their pastors had been rabbled were declared vacant to the clause which re-established synodic government no serious opposition appears to have been made but three days were spent in discussing the question whether the sovereign should have power to convoke and to dissolve ecclesiastical assemblies and the point was at last left in dangerous ambiguity some other clauses were long and vehemently debated it was said that the immense power given to the sixty was incompatible with the fundamental principle of the polity which the estates were about to set up that principle was that all presbyters were equal and that there ought to be no order of ministers of religion superior to the order of presbyters what did it matter whether the sixty were called prelates or not if they were to lord it with more prelatical authority over god's heritage to the argument that the proposed arrangement was in the very peculiar circumstances of the church the most convenient that could be made the objectors replied that such reasoning might suit the mouth of an erastian but that all orthodox presbyterians held that the parity of ministers to be ordained by christ and that where christ had spoken christians were not at liberty to consider what was convenient with much greater warmth and much stronger reason the minority attacked the clause which sanctioned the lawless act of the western fanatics surely it was said a rabbled curate might well be left to the severe scrutiny of the sixty inquisitors if he was deficient in parts or learning if he was loose in life if he was heterodox in doctrine those stern judges would not fail to detect and to depose him they would probably think a game of bowls a prayer borrowed from the English liturgy, or a sermon in which the slightest taint of Arminianism could be discovered, a sufficient reason for pronouncing his benefice vacant. Was it not monstrous, after constituting a tribunal from which he could scarcely hope for bare justice, to condemn him without allowing him to appear even before that tribunal, to condemn him without a trial, to condemn without an accusation? did ever a grave senate since the beginning of the world treat as 
a man as a criminal merely because he had been robbed pelted hustled dragged through snow and mire and threatened with death if he returned to the house which was his by law the duke of hamilton glad to have so good an opportunity of attacking the new lord commissioner spoke with great vehemence against this odious clause we are told that no attempt was made to answer him and though those who tell us so were zealous episcopalians we may easily believe their report for what answer was it possible to return melville on whom the chief responsibility lay sate on the throne in profound silence through the whole of this tempestuous debate it is probable that his conduct was determined by considerations which prudence and shame prevented him from explaining the state of the southwestern shires was such that it would have been impossible to put the rabbled ministers in possession of their dwellings and churches without employing a military force without garrisoning every manse without placing guards round every pulpit and without handing over some ferocious enthusiast to the provost marshal and it would be no easy task for the government to keep down by sword at once the jacobites of the highlands and the coventers of the lowlands the majority having made up their minds for reasons which could not be well produced became clamorous for the question no more debate was the cry we have heard enough a vote a vote a question was put according to the scottish form approve or not approve the article hamilton insisted that the question should be approve or not approve the rabbling after much altercation he was overruled and the clause passed only fifteen or sixteen members voted with him he warmly and loudly exclaimed amidst much angry interruption that he was sorry to see a scottish parliament disgrace itself by such iniquity he then left the house with several of his friends it is impossible not to sympathize with the indignation which he expressed yet we ought to remember that it is the nature of injustice to generate injustice there are wrongs which it is almost impossible to repair without committing other wrongs and such a wrong had been done to the people of scotland in the preceding generation it was because the parliament of the restoration had legislated in insolent defiance of the sense of the nation that the parliament of the revolution had to abase itself before the mob when hamilton and his adherents had retired one of the preachers who had been admitted to the hall called out to the members who were near him fie fie do not lose time make haste get all over before he comes back this advice was taken four or five sturdy prelatists stayed to give a last vote against presbytery four or five equally sturdy coventers stayed to mark their dislike of what seemed to them a compromise between the lord and ball but the act was passed by an overwhelming majority two supplementary acts speedily followed one of them now happily repealed required every office bearer in every university of scotland to sign the confession of faith and to give in his adhesion to the new form of church government the other settled the important and delicate question of patronage knox had in the first book of discipline asserted the right of every christian congregation to choose its own pastor melville had not in the second book of discipline gone quite so far but he had declared that no pastor could lawfully be forced on an unwilling congregation patronage had been abolished by a covenanted parliament in sixteen forty nine and restored by a royalist parliament in sixteen sixty one what ought to be done in sixteen ninety it was no easy matter to decide scarcely any question seemed to have caused so much anxiety to william he had in his private instructions given the lord commissioner authority to assent to the abolition of patronage if nothing else would satisfy the estates but this authority was most unwillingly given and the king hoped that it would not be used it is he said the taking of men's property melville succeeded in effecting a compromise patronage was abolished but it was enacted that every patron should receive six hundred marks scots equivalent to thirty-five pounds sterling as a compensation for his rights the sum seems ludicrously small yet when the nature of the property and the poverty of the country are considered it may be doubted whether a patron would have made much more by going into the market the largest sum that any member ventured to propose was nine hundred marks little more than fifty pounds sterling 
the right of proposing a minister was given to a parochial council consisting of the protestant landowners and the elders the congregation might object to the person proposed and the presbytery was to judge of the objections this arrangement did not give to the people all the power to which even the second book of discipline had declared they were entitled but the odious name of patronage was taken away it was probably thought that the elders and landowners of a parish would seldom persist in nominating a person to whom the majority of the congregation had strong objections and indeed it did not appear that while the act of sixteen ninety continued in force the peace of the church was ever broken by disputes such as produced the schisms of seventeen thirty two of seventeen fifty six and of eighteen forty three montgomery had done all in his power to prevent the estates from settling the ecclesiastical polity of the realm he had incited the zealous covenanters to demand what he knew the government would never grant he had protested against all erastianism against all compromise dutch presbyterianism he said would not do for scotland she must have again the system of sixteen forty nine that system was deduced from the word of god it was the most powerful check that had ever been devised on the tyranny of wicked kings and it ought to be restored without addition or diminution his jacobite allies could not conceal their disgust and mortification at hearing him hold such language and they were by no means satisfied with the explanations which he gave them in private while they were wrangling with him on this subject a messenger arrived at edinburgh with important dispatches from james and from mary of modena these dispatches had been written in the confident expectation that the large promises of montgomery would be fulfilled and that the scottish estates would under his dexterous management declare for the rightful sovereign against the usurper james was so grateful for the unexpected support of his old enemies that he entirely forgot the services and disregarded the feelings of his old friends the three chiefs of the club rebels and puritans as they were had become his favorites annandale was to be a marquis governor of edinburgh castle and lord high commissioner montgomery was to be earl of Ayr and secretary of state ross was to be an earl and to command the guards an unprincipled lawyer named james stuart who had been deeply concerned in argyle's insurrection who had changed sides and supported the dispensing power who had then changed sides a second time and concurred in the revolution and who had now changed sides a third time and was scheming to bring about a restoration was to be lord advocate the privy council the court session the army were to be filled with whigs a council of five was appointed which all loyal subjects were to obey and in this council annandale ross and montgomery formed the majority mary of modena informed montgomery that five thousand pounds sterling had been remitted to his order and that five thousand more would soon follow it was impossible that balcaris and those who had acted with him should not bitterly resent the manner in which they were treated their names were not even mentioned all that they had done and suffered seemed to have faded away from their master's mind he had now given them fair notice that if they should at the hazard of their land and lives succeed in restoring him all that he had to give would be given to those who had deposed him they too when they read his letters knew what he did not know when the letters were written that he had been duped by the confident boasts and promises of the apostate whigs he imagined that the club was omnipotent at edinburgh and in truth the club had become a mere byword of contempt the tory jacobites easily found pretexts for refusing to obey the presbyterian jacobites to whom the banished king had delegated his authority they complained that montgomery had not shown them all the dispatches which he had received they affected to suspect that he had tampered with the seals he called god almighty to witness that the suspicion was unfounded but oaths were very naturally regarded as insufficient guarantees by men who had just been swearing allegiance to a king against whom they were conspiring there was a violent outbreak of passions on both sides the coalition was dissolved the papers were flung into the fire and in a few days the infamous triumvir who had been in the short space of a year violent williamites and violent jacobites became williamites again and attempted to make their peace with the government by accusing each other ross was the first who turned informer 
after the fashion of the school in which he had been bred, he committed this base action with all the forms of sanctity. He pretended to be greatly troubled in mind, sent for a celebrated Presbyterian minister named Dunlop, and bemoaned himself piteously, There's a load on my conscience, there is a secret which I know I ought to disclose, but I cannot bring myself to do it. Dunlop prayed long and fervently. Ross groaned and wept. At last it seemed that heaven had been stormed by the violence of supplication. The truth came out, and many lies with it. The divine and the penitent then returned thanks together. Dunlop went with the news to Melville. Ross set off for England to make his peace at court, and performed his journey safely, though some of his accomplices, who had heard of his repentance, but had been little edified by it, had laid plans for cutting his throat by the way. At London he protested, on his honor and on the word of a gentleman, that he had been drawn in, that he had always disliked the plot, and that Montgomery and Ferguson were the real criminals. End of section 8. Recording by Richard Carpenter in Seattle, Washington. Line of chapter 16 of the History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.T. Macduff. The History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 16, Section 9. Dunlop was, in the meantime, magnifying, wherever he went, the divine goodness which had, by so humble an instrument as himself, brought a noble person back to the right path. Montgomery no sooner heard of this wonderful work of grace than he too began to experience compunction. He went to Melville, made a confession not exactly coinciding with Ross's, and obtained a pass for England. William was then in Ireland, and Mary was governing in his stead. At her feet Montgomery threw himself. He tried to move her pity by speaking of his broken fortunes, and to ingratiate himself with her by praising her sweet and affable manners. He gave up to her the names of his fellow plotters. He vowed to dedicate his whole life to her service if she would obtain for him some place which might enable him to subsist with decency. She was so much touched by his supplications and flatteries that she recommended him to her husband's favor. But the just distrust and abhorrence with which William regarded Montgomery were not to be overcome. Before the traitor had been admitted to Mary's presence, he had obtained a promise that he should be allowed to depart in safety. The promise was kept. During some months he lay hid in London, and contrived to carry on a negotiation with the government. He offered to be a witness against his accomplices, on condition of having a good place. William would bid no higher than a pardon. At length the communications were broken off. Montgomery retired for a time to France. He soon returned to London, and passed the miserable remnant of his life in forming plots which came to nothing, and in writing libels which are distinguished by the grace and vigor of their style from most of the productions of the Jacobite press. Annandale, when he learned that his two accomplices had turned approvers, retired to Bath and pretended to drink the waters. Thence he was soon brought up to London by a warrant. He acknowledged that he had been seduced into treason but he declared that he had only said amen to the plans of others, and that his childlike simplicity had been imposed on by Montgomery, that worst, that falsest, that most unquiet of human beings. The noble penitent then proceeded to make atonement for his own crime by criminating other people, English and Scotch, Whig and Tory, guilty and innocent. Some he accused on his own knowledge, and some on mere hearsay. Among those whom he accused on his own knowledge, was Neville Payne, who had not, it should seem, been mentioned either by Ross or by Montgomery. Payne, pursued by messengers and warrants, was so ill-advised as to take refuge in Scotland. Had he remained in England he would have been safe, for though the moral proofs of his own guilt were complete, there was not such legal evidence as would have satisfied a jury that he had committed high treason. He could not be subjected to torture in order to force him to furnish evidence against himself, nor could he be long confined without being brought to trial. 
but the moment that he passed the border he was at the mercy of the government of which he was the deadly foe. The claim of right had recognized torture as, in cases like his, a legitimate mode of obtaining information, and no habeas corpus act secured him against a long detention. The unhappy man was arrested, carried to Edinburgh, and brought before the Privy Council. The general notion was that he was a knave and a coward, and that the first sign of the boots and thumbscrews would bring out all the guilty secrets with which he had been entrusted. But Payne had a far braver spirit than those high-born plotters with whom it was his misfortune to have been connected. Twice he was subjected to frightful torments, but not a word inculpating himself or any other person could be wrung out of him. Some counsellors left the board in horror, but the pious Crawford presided. He was not much troubled with the weakness of compassion where an Amalekite was concerned, and forced the executioner to hammer in wedge after wedge between the knees of the prisoner, till the pain was as great as the human frame can sustain without dissolution. Payne was then carried to the castle of Edinburgh, where he long remained, utterly forgotten, as he touchingly complained, by those whose sake he had endured more than the bitterness of death. Yet no ingratitude could dampen the ardor of his fanatical loyalty and he continued year after year in his cell to plan insurrections and invasions. Before Payne's arrest, the estates had been adjourned after a session as important as any that had ever been held in Scotland. The nation generally acquiesced in the new ecclesiastical constitution. The indifferent, a large portion of every society, were glad that the anarchy was over and conformed to the Presbyterian Church as they had conformed to the Episcopal Church. To the moderate Presbyterians, the settlement which had been made was on the whole satisfactory. Most of the strict Presbyterians brought themselves to accept it under protest, as a large installment of what was due. They missed indeed what they considered as the perfect beauty and symmetry of that church which had, forty years before, been the glory of Scotland. But though the second temple was not equal to the first, the chosen people might well rejoice to think that they were, after a long captivity in Babylon, suffered to rebuild though imperfectly, the house of God on the old foundations. Nor could it misbecome them to feel for the latitudinarian William a grateful affection such as the restored Jews had felt for the heathen Cyrus. There were, however, two parties which regarded the settlement of 1690 with implacable detestation. Those Scotsmen who were Episcopalians on conviction and with fervor appear to have been few. But among them were some persons superior, not perhaps in natural parts, but in learning, in taste, and in the art of composition, to the theologians of the sect which had now become dominant. It might not have been safe for the ejected curates and professors to give vent in their own country to the anger which they felt, but the English press was open to them, and they were sure of the approbation of a large part of the English people. During several years they continued to torment their enemies and to amuse the public with a succession of ingenious and spirited pamphlets. In some of these works the hardships suffered by the rabbled priests of the western shires are set forth with a skill which irresistibly moves pity and an indignation. In others the cruelty with which the covenanters had been treated during the reigns of the last two kings of the house of Stuart is extenuated by every artifice of sophistry. There is much joking on the bad Latin which some Presbyterian teachers had uttered while seated in academic chairs lately occupied by great scholars. Much was said about the ignorant contempt which the victorious barbarians professed for science and literature. They were accused of anathematizing the modern systems of natural philosophy as damnable heresies, of condemning geometry as a soul-destroying pursuit, of discouraging even the study of those tongues in which the sacred books were written. Learning, it was said, would soon be extinct in Scotland. The universities, under their new rulers, were languishing and must soon perish. The booksellers had been half ruined. They found that the whole profit of their business would not pay the rent of their shops, and were preparing to emigrate to some country where letters were held in esteem by those whose office was to instruct the public. Among the ministers of religion, no purchaser of books was left. The Episcopalian divine was glad to sell for a morsel of bread whatever part of his library had not been torn to pieces or burned by the Christmas mobs, and the only library of a Presbyterian divine consisted of an explanation of the Apocalypse and a commentary on the Song of Songs. The pulpit oratory of the triumphant party was an inexhaustible subject of mirth. One little volume, entitled 
the Scotch Presbyterian eloquence displayed, had an immense success in the South among both high churchmen and scoffers, and is not yet quite forgotten. It was indeed a book well fitted to lie on the hall table of a squire whose religion consisted in hating extemporaneous prayer and nasal psalmody. On a rainy day, when it was impossible to hunt or shoot, neither the card table nor the backgammon board would have been, in the intervals of the flagon and the pasty, so agreeable a resource. Nowhere else, perhaps, can be found, in so small a compass, so large a collection of ludicrous quotations and anecdotes. Some grave men, however, who bore no love to the Calvinistic doctrine or discipline, shook their heads over this lively jest book, and hinted their opinion that the writer, while holding up to derision the absurd rhetoric by which coarse-minded and ignorant men tried to illustrate dark questions of theology, and to excite devotional feeling among the populace, had sometimes forgotten the reverence due to sacred things. The effect which tracts of this sort produced on the public mind of England could not be fully discerned while England and Scotland were independent of each other but manifested itself very soon after the union of the kingdoms in a way which we still have reason and which our posterity will probably long have reason to lament. The extreme Presbyterians were as much out of humor as the extreme prelatists, and were as little inclined as the extreme prelatists to take the oath of allegiance to William and Mary. Indeed, though the Jacobite non-juror and the Cameronian non-juror were diametrically opposed to each other in opinion, Though they regarded each other with mortal aversion, though neither of them would have had any scruple about persecuting the other, they had much in common. They were perhaps the two most remarkable specimens that the world could show of perverse absurdity. Each of them considered his darling form of ecclesiastical polity not as a means but as an end, as the one thing needful, as the quintessence of the Christian religion. Each of them childishly fancied that he had found a theory of civil government in his Bible, neither shrank from the frightful consequences to which his theory led. To all objections both had one answer, Thus saith the Lord. Both agreed in boasting that the arguments, which to atheistical politicians seemed unanswerable, presented no difficulty to the saint. It might be perfectly true that, by relaxing the rigor of his principles, he might save his country from slavery, anarchy, universal ruin. But his business was not to save his country, but to save his soul. He obeyed the commands of God and left the event to God. One of the two fanatical sects held that, to the end of time, the nation would be bound to obey the heir of the Stuarts. The other held that, to the end of time, the nation would be bound by the solemn league and covenant, and thus both agreed in regarding the new sovereigns as usurpers. The Presbyterian non-jurors have scarcely been heard of out of Scotland and perhaps it may not now be generally known, even in Scotland, how long they continued to form a distinct class. They held that their country was under a pre-contract to the Most High, and could never, while the world lasted, enter into any engagement inconsistent with that pre-contract. An Erastian, a latitudinarian, a man who knelt to receive the bread and wine from the hands of bishops, and who bore, though not very patiently, to hear anthems chaunted by choristers in white vestments, could not be king of a covenanted kingdom. William had, moreover, forfeited all claim to the crown by committing that sin for which, in the old time, a dynasty preternaturally appointed had been preternaturally deposed. He had connived at the escape of his father-in-law, that idolater, that murderer, that man of Belial, who ought to have been hewn to pieces before the Lord, like Agag. Nay, the crime of William had exceeded that of Saul, Saul had spared only one Amalekite, and had smitten the rest. What Amalekite had William smitten? The pure church had been twenty-eight years under persecution. Her children had been imprisoned, transported, branded, shot, hanged, drowned, tortured. And yet he who called himself her deliverer had not suffered her to see her desire upon her enemies. The bloody Claverhouse had been graciously received at St. James. The bloody Mackenzie had found a secure and luxurious retreat among the malignants of Oxford. The younger Dalrymple who had prosecuted the saints, the elder Dalrymple who had sat in judgment on the saints, were great and powerful. It was said by careless Gallios that there was no choice between William and James, and that it was wisdom to choose the less of two evils. Such was indeed the wisdom of this world. But the wisdom which was from above taught us that, of two things, both of which were evil in the sight of God, we should choose neither. 
As soon as James was restored, it would be a duty to disown and withstand him. The present duty was to disown and withstand his son-in-law. Nothing must be said, nothing must be done, that could be construed into a recognition of the authority of the man from Holland. The godly must pay no duties to him, must hold no offices under him, must receive no wages from him, must sign no instruments in which he was styled king. Anne succeeded William, and Anne was designated by those who called themselves the remnant of the true church, as the pretended queen, the wicked woman, the Jezebel. George I succeeded Anne, and George I was the pretended king, the German beast. George II succeeded George I. George II, too, was a pretended king, and was accused of having outdone the wickedness of his wicked predecessors by passing a law in defiance of that divine law which ordains that no witch shall be suffered to live. George III succeeded George II, and still these men continued with unabated steadfastness, though in language less ferocious than before, to disclaim all allegiance to an uncovenanted sovereign. So late as the year 1806, they were still bearing their public testimony against the sin of owning his government by paying taxes, by taking out excise licenses, by joining the volunteers, or by laboring on public works. The number of these zealots went on diminishing till at length they were so thinly scattered over Scotland that they were nowhere numerous enough to have a meeting-house, and were known by the name of the non-hearers. They, however, still assembled and prayed in private dwellings, and still persisted in considering themselves as the chosen generation, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the peculiar people, which amidst the common degeneracy alone preserve the faith of a better age. It is by no means improbable that this superstition, the most irrational and the most unsocial into which Protestant Christianity has ever been corrupted by human prejudices and passions, may still linger in a few obscure farmhouses. The king was but half satisfied with the manner in which the ecclesiastical polity of Scotland had been settled. He thought that the Episcopalians had been hardly used, and he apprehended that they might be still more hardly used when the new system was fully organized. He had been very desirous that the act which established the Presbyterian Church should be accompanied by an act allowing persons who were not members of that church to hold their own religious assemblies freely and he had particularly directed Melville to look to this. But some popular preachers harangued so vehemently at Edinburgh against liberty of conscience, which they called the mystery of iniquity, that Melville did not venture to obey his master's instructions. A draught of a toleration act was offered to the Parliament by a private member, but was coldly received and suffered to drop. William, however, was fully determined to prevent the dominant sect from indulging in the luxury of persecution and he took an early opportunity of announcing his determination. The first general assembly of the newly established church met soon after his return from Ireland. Some zealous Presbyterians hoped that Crawford would be the commissioner, and the ministers of Edinburgh drew up a paper in which they very intelligibly hinted that this was their wish. William, however, selected Lord Carmichael, a nobleman distinguished by good sense, humanity, and moderation. The royal letter to the assembly was eminently wise in substance and impressive in language. We expect, the king wrote, that your management shall be such that we may have no reason to repent of what we have done. We never could be of the mind that violence was suited to the advancing of true religion, nor do we intend that our authority shall ever be a tool to the irregular passions of any party. Moderation is what religion enjoins, what neighboring churches expect from you, and what we recommend to you. The Sixty and their associates would probably have been glad to reply in language resembling that which, as some of them could well remember, had been held by the clergy to Charles the Second during his residence in Scotland. But they had just been informed that there was in England a strong feeling in favor of the rabbled curates, and that it would, at such a conjecture, be madness in the body which represented the Presbyterian Church to quarrel with the king. The assembly therefore returned a grateful and respectful answer to the royal letter, and assured His Majesty that they had suffered too much from oppression ever to be oppressors. End of section 9 Recording by S.T. Macduff Section 10 of chapter 16 of A History of England This is a LibriVox recording.
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter 16, Section 10 Meanwhile the troops all over the continent were going into winter quarters. The campaign had everywhere been indecisive. The victory gained by Luxembourg at Fleurus had produced no important effect. On the Upper Rhine great armies had eyed each other month after month without exchanging a blow. In Catalonia a few small forts had been taken. In the east of Europe the Turks had been successful on some points, the Christians on other points, and the termination of the contest seemed to be as remote as ever. The coalition had in the course of the year lost one valuable member and gained another. The Duke of Lorraine, the ablest captain in the imperial service, was no more. He had died as he had lived an exile and a wanderer, and had bequeathed to his children nothing but his name and his rights. It was popularly said that the Confederacy could better have spared thirty thousand soldiers than such a general. But scarcely had the allied courts gone into mourning for him, when they were consoled by learning that another prince, superior to him in power, and not inferior to him in capacity or courage, had joined the League against France. This was Victor Amadeus, Duke of Savoy. He was a young man, but he was already versed in those arts for which the statesmen of Italy had, ever since the thirteenth century, been celebrated, those arts by which Castruccio Castracchiani and Francis Sforza rose to greatness, and which Machiavel reduced to a system. No sovereign in modern Europe has, with so small a principality, exercised so great an influence during so long a period. He had for a time submitted with a show of cheerfulness, but with secret reluctance and resentment, to the French ascendancy. When the war broke out, he professed neutrality, but entered into private negotiations with the House of Austria. He would probably have continued to dissemble till he found some opportunity of striking an unexpected blow, had not his crafty schemes been disconcerted by the decision and vigour of Louis. A French army, commanded by Catinat, an officer of great skill and valour, marched into Piedmont. The Duke was informed that his conduct had excited suspicions which he could remove only by admitting foreign garrisons into Turin and Vercelli. He found that he must either be the slave or the open enemy of his powerful and imperious neighbour. His choice was soon made, and a war began which during seven years found employment for some of the best generals and best troops of Louis. An envoy extraordinary from Savoy went to The Hague, proceeded thence to London, presented his credentials in the banqueting house, and addressed to William a speech which was speedily translated into many languages, and read in every part of Europe. The orator congratulated the King on the success of that great enterprise which had restored England to her ancient place among the nations, and had broken the chains of Europe. That my master, he said, can now at length venture to express feelings which have long been concealed in the recesses of his heart, is part of the debt which he owes to your Majesty. You have inspired him with the hope of freedom after so many years of bondage. It had been determined that, during the approaching winter, a congress of all the powers hostile to France should be held at The Hague. William was impatient to proceed thither, but it was necessary that he should first hold a session of Parliament. Early in October the Houses reassembled at Westminster. The members had generally come up in good humour. Those Tories whom it was possible to conciliate had been conciliated by the Act of Grace, and by the large share which they had obtained of the favours of the Crown. Those Whigs who were capable of learning had learned much from the lesson which William had given them, and had ceased to expect that he would descend from the rank of a king to that of a party leader. Both Whigs and Tories had, with few exceptions, been alarmed by the prospect of a French invasion, and cheered by the news of the victory of the Boyne. The sovereign, who had shed his blood for their nation and their religion, stood at this moment higher in public estimation than at any time since his accession. His speech from the throne called forth the loud acclamation of lords and commons. Thanks were unanimously voted by both houses to the King for his achievements in Ireland, and to the Queen for the prudence with which she had, during his absence, governed England. 
thus commenced a session distinguished among the sessions of that reign by harmony and tranquillity. No report of the debates has been preserved, unless a long-forgotten lampoon, in which some of the speeches made on the first day are burlesqued in doggerel rhymes, may be called a report. The time of the Commons appears to have been chiefly occupied in discussing questions arising out of the elections of the preceding spring. The supplies necessary for the war, though large, were granted with alacrity. The number of regular troops for the next year was fixed at seventy thousand, of whom twelve thousand were to be horse or dragoons. The charge of this army, the greatest that England had ever maintained, amounted to about two million three hundred thousand pounds, the charge of the navy to about eighteen hundred thousand pounds. The charge of the ordnance was included in these sums, and was roughly estimated at one-eighth of the naval and one-fifth of the military expenditure. The whole of the extraordinary aid granted to the King exceeded four millions. The Commons justly thought that the extraordinary liberality with which they had provided for the public service entitled them to demand extraordinary securities against waste and peculation. A bill was brought in empowering nine commissioners to examine and state the public accounts. The nine were named in the bill, and were all members of the lower house. The lords agreed to the bill without amendments, and the King gave his assent. The debates on the ways and means occupied a considerable part of the session. It was resolved that sixteen hundred and fifty thousand pounds should be raised by a direct monthly assessment on land. The excise duties on ale and beer were doubled, and the import duties on raw silk, linen, timber, glass, and some other articles were increased. Thus far was little difference of opinion. But soon the smooth course of business was disturbed by a proposition which was much more popular than just or humane. Taxes of unprecedented severity had been imposed, and yet it might well be doubted whether these taxes would be sufficient. Why, it was asked, should not the cost of the Irish war be borne by the Irish insurgents? How those insurgents had acted in their mock parliament all the world knew, and nothing could be more reasonable than to meet to them from their own measure. They ought to be treated as they had treated the Saxon colony. Every acre which the act of settlement had left them ought to be seized by the state for the purpose of defraying that expense which their turbulence and perverseness had made necessary. It is not strange that a plan which at once gratified national animosity and held out the hope of pecuniary relief should have been welcomed with eager delight. A bill was brought in, which bore but too much resemblance to some of the laws passed by the Jacobite legislators of Dublin. By this bill it was provided that the property of every person who had been in rebellion against the King and Queen since the day on which they were proclaimed should be confiscated and that the proceeds should be applied to the support of the war. An exception was made in favour of such Protestants as had merely submitted to superior force, but to Papists no indulgence was shown. The royal prerogative of clemency was limited. The King might, indeed, if such were his pleasure, spare the lives of his vanquished enemies, but he was not to be permitted to save any part of their estates from the general doom. He was not to have it in his power to grant a capitulation which should secure to Irish Roman Catholics the enjoyment of their hereditary lands. Nay, he was not to be allowed to keep faith with persons whom he had already received to mercy, who had kissed his hand and had heard from his lips the promise of protection. An attempt was made to insert a proviso in favour of Lord Dover. Dover, who, with all his faults, was not without some English feelings, had, by defending the interests of his native country at Dublin, made himself odious to both the Irish and the French. After the Battle of the Boyne his situation was deplorable. Neither at Limerick nor at Saint-Germain could he hope to be welcomed. In his despair he threw himself at William's feet, promised to live peaceably, and was graciously assured that he had nothing to fear. Though the royal word seemed to be pledged to this unfortunate man, the Commons resolved, by a hundred and nineteen votes to a hundred and twelve, that his property should not be exempted from the general confiscation. The bill went up to the peers, but the peers were not inclined to pass it without considerable amendments, and such amendments there was not time to make. 
numerous heirs at law, reversioners and creditors implored the upper house to introduce such provisos as might secure the innocent against all danger of being involved in the punishment of the guilty. Some petitioners asked to be heard by counsel. The king had made all his arrangements for a voyage to the Hague, and the day beyond which he could not postpone his departure drew near. The bill was therefore, happily for the honour of English legislation, consigned to that dark repository in which the abortive statutes of many generations sleep asleep, rarely disturbed by the historian or the antiquary. Another question, which slightly, and but slightly, discomposed the tranquillity of this short session, arose out of the disastrous and disgraceful battle of Beachy Head. Torrington had, immediately after that battle, been sent to the Tower, and had ever since remained there. A technical difficulty had arisen about the mode of bringing him to trial. There was no Lord High Admiral and whether the commissioners of the Admiralty were competent to execute martial law was a point which to some jurists appeared not perfectly clear. The majority of the judges held that the commissioners were competent, but, for the purpose of removing all doubt, a bill was brought into the Upper House, and to this bill several lords offered an opposition which seems to have been most unreasonable. The proposed law, they said, was a retrospective penal law, and therefore objectionable. If they used this argument in good faith, they were ignorant of the very rudiments of the science of legislation. To make a law for punishing that which, at the time when it was done, was not punishable, is contrary to all sound principle. But a law which merely alters the criminal procedure may, with perfect propriety, be made applicable to past as well as to future offences. It would have been the grossest injustice to give a retrospective operation to the law which made slave-trading felony. But there was not the smallest injustice in enacting that the Central Criminal Court should try felonies committed long before that court was in being. In Torrington's case the substantive law continued to be what it had always been. The definition of the crime, the amount of the penalty, remained unaltered. The only change was in the form of procedure, and that change the legislature was perfectly justified in making retrospectively. It is indeed hardly possible to believe that some of those who opposed the bill were duped by the fallacy of which they condescended to make use. The feeling of caste was strong among the lords. That one of themselves should be tried for his life by a court composed of plebeians seemed to them a degradation of their whole order. If their noble brother had offended, articles of impeachment ought to be exhibited against him. Westminster Hall ought to be fitted up, his peers ought to meet in their robes, and to give in their verdict on their honour, a Lord High Steward ought to pronounce the sentence and to break the staff. There was an end of privilege if an Earl was to be doomed to death by tarpaulin seated around a table in the cabin of a ship. These feelings had so much influence that the bill passed the Upper House by a majority of only two. In the lower house, where the dignities and immunities of the nobility were regarded with no friendly feeling, there was little difference of opinion. Torrington requested to be heard at the bar, and spoke there at great length, but weakly and confusedly. He boasted of his services, of his sacrifices, and of his wounds. He abused the Dutch, the Board of Admiralty, and the Secretary of State. The bill, however, went through all its stages without a division. Early in December Torrington was sent under guard down the river to Sheerness. There the court-martial met on board of a frigate named the Kent. The investigation lasted three days, and during those days the ferment was great in London. Nothing was heard of on the exchange, in the coffee-houses, nay, even at the church doors, but Torrington. Parties ran high, wagers to an immense amount were depending, rumours were hourly arriving by land and water, and every rumour was exaggerated and distorted by the way. From the day on which the news of the ignominious battle arrived down to the very eve of the trial, public opinion had been very unfavourable to the prisoner. His name, we are told by contemporary pamphleteers, was hardly ever mentioned without a curse. But when the crisis of his fate drew nigh, there was, as in our country there often is, a reaction. All his merits, his courage, his good nature, his firm adherence to the Protestant religion in the evil times were remembered. It was impossible to deny that he was sunk in sloth and luxury, that he neglected the most important business for his pleasures, and that he could not say no to a boon companion or to a mistress, 
but for these faults excuses and soft names were found. His friends used without scruple all the arts which could raise a national feeling in his favour, and these arts were powerfully assisted by the intelligence that the hatred which was felt towards him in Holland had vented itself in indignities to some of his countrymen. The cry was that a bold, jolly, free-handed English gentleman, of whom the worst that could be said was that he liked wine and women, was to be shot in order to gratify the spite of the Dutch. What passed at the trial tended to confirm the populace in this notion. Most of the witnesses against the prisoner were Dutch officers. The Dutch rear admiral, who took upon himself the part of prosecutor, forgot himself so far as to accuse the judges of partiality. When, at length, on the evening of the third day, Torrington was pronounced not guilty, many who had recently clamoured for his blood seemed to be well pleased with his acquittal. He returned to London, free, and with his sword by his side. As his yacht went up the Thames, every ship which he passed saluted him. He took his seat at the House of Lords, and even ventured to present himself at court. But most of the peers looked coldly on him. William would not see him, and ordered him to be dismissed from the service. There was another subject about which no vote was passed by either of the Houses, but about which there is reason to believe that some acrimonious discussion took place in both. The Whigs, though much less violent than in the preceding year, could not patiently see Carmarthen as nearly Prime Minister as any English subject could be under a Prince of William's character. Though no man had taken a more prominent part in the Revolution than the Lord President, though no man had more to fear from a counter-revolution, his old enemies would not believe that he had from his heart renounced those arbitrary doctrines for which he had once been zealous or that he could bear true allegiance to a government sprung from resistance. Through the last six months of 1690 he was mercilessly lampooned. Sometimes he was King Thomas, and sometimes Tom the Tyrant. William was adjured not to go to the Continent, leaving his worst enemy close to the ear of the Queen. Halifax, who had in the preceding year been ungenerously and ungratefully persecuted by the Whigs, was now mentioned by them with respect and regret for he was the enemy of their enemy. The face, the figure, the bodily infirmities of Carmarthen were ridiculed. Those dealings with the French court in which twelve years before he had, rather by his misfortune than by his fault, been implicated, were represented in the most odious colours. He was reproached with his impeachment and his imprisonment. Once, it was said, he had escaped, but vengeance might still overtake him, and London might enjoy the long-deferred pleasure of seeing the old traitor flung off the ladder in the blue riband which he disgraced. All the members of his family, wife, son, daughters, were assailed with savage invective and contemptuous sarcasm. All who were supposed to be closely connected with him by political ties came in for a portion of this abuse, and none had so large a portion as Lowther. The feeling indicated by these satires was strong among the Whigs in Parliament. Several of them deliberated on plan of attack, and were in hopes that they should be able to raise such a storm as would make it impossible for him to remain at the head of affairs. It would seem that, at this time, his influence in the royal closet was not quite what it had been. Godolphin, whom he did not love and could not control, but whose financial skill had been greatly missed during the summer, was brought back to the Treasury, and made First Commissioner. Lowther, who was the Lord President's own man, still sat at the board, but no longer presided there. It is true that there was not then such a difference as there now is between the First Lord and his colleagues. Still, the change was important and significant. Marlborough, whom Carmarthen disliked, was, in military affairs, not less trusted than Godolphin in financial affairs. The seals which Shrewsbury had resigned in the summer had ever since been lying in William's secret drawer. The Lord President probably expected that he should be consulted before they were given away, but he was disappointed. Sidney was sent for from Ireland, and the seals were delivered to him. The first intimation which the Lord President received of this important appointment was not made in a manner likely to smooth his feelings. "'Did you meet the new Secretary of State going out?' said William. "'No, sir,' answered the Lord President. "'I met nobody but my Lord Sidney.' 
"'He is the new secretary,' said William. "'He will do till I find a fit man, "'and he will be quite willing to resign as soon as I find a fit man. "'Any other person that I could put in "'would think himself ill-used if I were to put him out.' "'If William had said all that was in his mind, "'he would probably have added that Sidney, "'though not a great orator or statesman, "'was one of the very few English politicians "'who could be as entirely trusted as Bentinck or Sulstein. Carmarthen listened with a bitter smile. It was new, he afterwards said, to see a nobleman placed in the secretary's office as a footman was placed in a box at the theatre, merely in order to keep a seat till his betters came. But this jest was cover for serious mortification and alarm. The situation of the Prime Minister was unpleasant and even perilous, and the duration of his power would probably have been short, had not fortune, just at this moment, put it in his power to confound his adversaries by rendering a great service to the State. End of section 10「Section 11 of Chapter 16 of A History of England」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England by Thomas Bannington Macaulay Chapter 16, Section 11 The Jacobites had seemed in August to be completely trushed. The victory of the Boyne, and the irresistible explosion of patriotic feeling produced by the appearance of Torval's fleet on the coast of Devonshire, had cowed the boldest champions of hereditary right. Most of the chief plotters passed some weeks in confinement or in concealment. But, widely as the ramification of the conspiracy had extended, only one traitor suffered the punishment of his crime. This was a man named Geoffrey Cross who kept an inn on the beach near Rye, and who, when the French fleet was on the coast of Sussex, had given information to Torval. When it appeared that this solitary example was thought sufficient, when the danger of invasion was over, when their popular enthusiasm excited by that danger had subsided, when the lenity of the government had permitted some conspirators to leave their prisons and encouraged others to venture out of their hiding-places, the factions, which had been prostrated and stunned, began to give signs of returning animation. The old traitors again mustered at the old haunts, exchanged significant looks and eager whispers, and drew from their pockets libels on the court at Kensington, and letters in milk and lemon juice from the court of Saint-Germain. Preston, Dartmouth, Clarendon, and Penn were amongst the most busy. With them was leagued the non-juring Bishop of Ely, who was still permitted by the government to reside in the palace, now no longer his own, and who had but a short time before called heaven to witness that he detested the thought of inviting foreigners to invade England. One good opportunity had been lost, but another was at hand, and must not be suffered to escape. The usurper would soon be again out of England. The administration would soon be again confided to a weak woman and a divided council. The year which was closing had certainly been unlucky, but that which was about to commence might be more auspicious. In December a meeting of the leading Jacobites was held. The sense of the assembly, which consisted exclusively of Protestants, was that something ought to be attempted, but that the difficulties were great. None ventured to recommend that James should come over unaccompanied by regular troops, Yet all, taught by the experience of the preceding summer, dreaded the effect which might be produced by the sight of French uniforms and standards on English ground. A paper was drawn up which would, it hoped, convince both James and Louis that a restoration could not be effected without the cordial concurrence of the nation. France, such was the substance of this remarkable document, might possibly make the island a heap of ruins, but never a subject province. It was hardly possible for any person, who had not had an opportunity of observing the temper of the public mind, to imagine a savage and dogged determination which men of all classes, sects and factions were prepared to resist any foreign potentate who should attempt to conquer the kingdom by force of arms. Nor could England be governed as a Roman Catholic country. 
There were five millions of Protestants in the realm. There were not a hundred thousand Papists. That such a minority should keep down of such a majority was physically impossible. And to physical impossibility all other considerations must give way. James would therefore do well to take without delay such measures as might indicate his resolution to protect the established religion. Unhappily, every letter which arrived from France contained something tending to irritate feelings which it was most desirable to soothe. Stories were everywhere current of slights offered at Saint-Germain to Protestants, who had given the highest proof of loyalty by following into banishment a master zealous for a faith which was not their own. The edicts which had been issued against the Huguenots might perhaps have been justified by the anarchical opinions and practices of those sectaries. But it was the height of injustice and of inhospitality to put these edicts in force against men who had been driven from their country solely on the account of their attachment to a Roman Catholic king. Surely sons of the Anglican Church, who had in obedience to her teaching sacrificed all that they most prized on earth to the royal cause, ought not to be any longer interdicted from assembling in such a modest edifice to celebrate her rites and to receive her consolations. An announcement that Louis had, at the request of James, permitted the English exiles to worship God according to their national forms would be the best prelude to the great attempt. That attempt ought to be made early in the spring. A French force must undoubtedly accompany His Majesty, but he must declare that he brought that force only for the defence of his person and for the protection of his loving subjects, and that, as soon as the foreign oppressors had been expelled, the foreign deliverers should be dismissed. He must also promise to govern according to law, and must refer all the points which had been in dispute between him and his people to the decision of a Parliament. It was determined that Preston should carry to Saint-Germain the resolution and suggestions of the conspirators. John Ashton, a person who had been clerk of the closet to Mary of Medina when she was on the throne, and who was entirely devoted to the interests of the exiled family, undertook to procure the means of conveyance, and for this purpose engaged the co-operation of a hot-headed young Jacobite named Elliot, who only knew in general that a service of some hazard was to be rendered to the good cause. It was easy to find in the port of London a vessel, the owner of which was not scrupulous about the use for which it might be wanted. Ashton and Elliot were introduced to the master of a smack named the James and Elizabeth. The Jacobite agents pretended to be smugglers, and talked of the thousands of pounds which might be got by a single lucky trip to France and back again. A bargain was struck, a sixpence was broken, and all the arrangements were made for the voyage. Preston was charged by his friends with a packet containing several important papers. Amongst these was a list of the English fleet furnished by Dartmouth, who was in communication with some of his old companions in arms, a minute of the resolutions which had been adopted at the meeting of the conspirators, and the heads of a declaration which it was thought desirable that James should publish at the moment of his landing. There were also six or seven letters from persons of note in the Jacobite party. Most of these letters were parables, but parables which it was not difficult to unriddle. One plotter used the cant of the law. There was hope that Mr. Jackson would soon recover his estate. The new landlord was a hired man, and had set the freeholders against him. A little matter would redeem the whole property. The opinion of the best counsel was in Mr. Jackson's favour. All that was necessary was that he should himself appear in Westminster Hall. The final hearing ought to be before the close of Easter term. Other writers affected the style of the Royal Exchange. There was a great demand for a cargo of the right sort. There was reason to hope that the old firm would still form profitable connections with houses with which it had hitherto no dealings. This was evidently an allusion to the discontented Whigs. But, it was added, the shipments must not be delayed. Nothing was so dangerous as to overstay the market. If the expected goods did not arrive by the 10th of March, the whole profit of the year would be lost. As to details, entire reliance may be placed on the excellent factor who was going over. 
Clarendon assumed the character of a matchmaker. There was great hope that the business which he had been negotiating would be brought to bear, and that a marriage portion would be well secured. Your relations, he wrote in allusion to his recent confinement, have been very hard on me this summer. Yet as soon as I could go safely abroad, I pursued the business. Catherine Sedley, encrusted Preston with a letter in which, without allegory or circumlocution, she complained that her lover had left her a daughter to support, and begged very hard for money. But the two most important dispatches were from Bishop Turner. They were directed to Mr. and Mrs. Redding, but the language was such as would have thought abject in any gentleman to hold except to royalty. The bishop assured their majesties that he was devoted to their cause, that he earnestly wished for a great occasion to prove his zeal, and that he would no more swerve from his duty to them than renounce his hope of heaven. He added, in phraseology metaphorical indeed, but perfectly intelligible, that he was the mouthpiece of several of the non-during prelates, and especially of Sancroft. Sir, I speak in the plural. These are the words of the letter to James because I write my elder brother's sentiments as well as mine own, and the rest of our family. The letter to Mary of Medina is to the same effect. I say this on behalf of my elder brother and the rest of my near relations, as well as for myself. All the letters with which Preston were charged referred the court of Saint-Germain to him for fuller information. He carried with him minutes in his own handwriting of the subjects with which he was to converse with his master and with the ministers of Lewis. These minutes, although concise and desultory, can for the most part be interpreted without difficulty. The vulnerable points of the coasts are mentioned. Gosport is defended only by palisades. The garrison at Portsmouth is small. The French fleet ought to be out in April, and to fight before the Dutch are in the Channel. There are a few broken words clearly importing that some at least of the non-juring bishops, when they declared before God that they have hoard the thought of inviting the French over, were dissembling. Everything was now ready for Preston's departure, but the owner of the James and Elizabeth had conceived a suspicion that the expedition for which his smack had been hired was rather of a political than a commercial nature. It occurred to him that more might be made by informing against his passengers than by conveying them safely. Intelligence of what was passing was conveyed to the Lord President. No intelligence could be more welcome to him. He was delighted to find that it was in his power to give a signal proof of his attachment to the government which his enemies had accused him of betraying. He took his measures with his usual energy and dexterity. His eldest son, the Earl of Danby, a bold, volatile, and somewhat eccentric young man, was fond of the sea, lived much among sailors, and was the proprietor of a small yacht of marvellous speed. This vessel, well manned, was placed under the command of a trusty officer named Billop, and was sent down the river, as if for the purpose of pressing mariners. At dead of night, the last night of the year 1690, Preston, Ashton and Elliot went on board of their smack near the tower. They were in great dread lest they should be stopped and searched, either by a frigate which lay off Woolwich, or by the guard posted at the blockhouse of Gravesend. But when they had passed both frigate and blockhouse without being challenged, their spirits rose, their appetite became keen. They unpacked a hamper well stocked with roast beef, mince pies and bottles of wine, and were just sitting down to their Christmas cheer when the alarm was given that a vessel from Tilbury was flying through the water after them. They had scarcely time to hide themselves in a dark hole among the gravel which was the ballast of their smack, when the chase was over, and Billop at the head of an armed party came aboard. The hatches was taken up, the conspirators were arrested, and their clothes were strictly examined. Preston, in his agitation, had dropped on the gravel his official seal and the packet of which he was the bearer. The seal was discovered where it had fallen. Ashton, aware of the importance of the papers, snatched them up and tried to conceal them, but they were soon found in his bosom. The prisoners then tried to cajole or to corrupt Billop. They called for wine, pledged him, praised his gentlemanlike demeanour, and assured him that if he would accompany them, nay, if he'd only let that little roll of paper fall overboard into the Thames, his fortune would be made.' 
The tide of affairs, they said, was on the turn. Things could not go on for ever as they had gone on of late, and it was in the captain's power to be as great and rich as he could desire. Philip, though courteous, was inflexible. The conspirators became sensible that their necks were in imminent danger. The emergency brought out strongly the true characters of all the three, characters which, but for such an emergency, might have remained for ever unknown. Preston had always been reputed a high-spirit and gallant gentleman, but the near prospect of a dungeon and a gallows together unmanned him. Elliot stormed and blasphemed, vowed that if he ever got free he would be revenged, and with horrible imprecations called on the thunder to strike the yacht, and on London Bridge to fall in and crush her. Hashton alone behaved with manly firmness. Late in the evening the yacht reached Whitehall Stairs, and the prisoners, strongly guarded, were conducted to the secretary's office. The papers which had been found in Ashton's bosom were inspected that night by Nottington and Carmathan, and were on the morning put by Carmathan into the hands of the king. Soon it was known all over London that a plot had been detected, that messengers whom the appearance of James had sent to solicit the help of an invading army from France had been arrested by the agents of the vigilant and energetic Lord President, and the documentary evidence which might affect the lives of some great men was in possession of the government. The Jacobites were terror-stricken, the clamour of the Whigs against Carmarthen was suddenly hushed, and the session ended in perfect harmony. On the 5th of January the King thanked the House for their support, and assured them that he would not grant away any forfeited property in Ireland till they should reassemble. He alluded to the plot which had just been discovered, and expressed a hope that the friends of England would not at such a moment be less active or less firmly united than her enemies. He then signified his pleasure that the Parliament should adjourn, and the following day he set out, attended by a splendid train of nobles, for the Congress at The Hague. End of section 11 End of chapter 16 of The History of England by Thomas Babington Macaulay